Thank you, Kobe. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, but yeah, no, thanks to Kobe for organizing all this. We, we don't even have to show up. We're already here. So this is, this is uh, all you, mate. Thank you. Uh, so anyway, uh, my name's Drew Baker. I'm the technical founder here at Funkhouse. We've been around for about nine or ten years now. Do we start recording? Yeah, yeah, we're already doing it. Okay. Yeah. Um, and Nick in the back corner is my business partner. Nick, Nick sells the websites and then we build them. So... <laughs> Yeah, yes. Yeah, well, that's how it works. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Nick. Uh, um, yeah, so anyway, uh, we've been doing this for nine or ten years now in the arts district the whole time. We've moved around a little bit, but we've been here now for uh, in this office for the last year or two now. Um, so this is all of the lessons that I've learned over the years uh, and tried to sort of keep a running little bullet points in GitHub, and I translated it all into a, a, a presentation here. Um, so I'll, I'll go forward here a little bit. So yeah, this is me. Um, most, this is a very opinionated talk, and it's gonna dovetail or uh, totally ricochet off of what John's gonna do next, because I'm gonna say a lot of things that John's gonna say, forget it and do it this other way. So I think this is gonna be good, because I think this will promote discussion, and. This is not me saying, hey, this is the right way to do it. This is just the way I've found works best. Uh, and my sort of point of view on all of that stuff is through running teams and building teams and teaching people to program over the last 10 years um, and all the websites we've built along the way. And so uh, my, my sort of background was in WordPress PHP sites for a long time. And then we went heavy into Vue and Nuxt about two and a bit years ago now. And so now we do everything in Nuxt with a wordless... Uh, WordPress headless CMS is the back end. So we're kind of touching a lot of different stuff. We use uh, Apollo and GraphQL a, a lot. So our, our tech stack now is pretty cutting edge, I think. Um, so that, that's kind of some of the stuff that we're doing. So yeah, most of this is the optimal way I think works well for teams, not necessarily the most efficient way. It's more easy for someone to step into because that's kind of the problem we deal with a lot is like we built a website three years ago and I have to make a fix to it tomorrow and the person who built it doesn't work here or has gone somewhere else. So I'll get into it. Uh, first thing first, I hate resets. Reset CSS, normalize CSS, all of those sorts of things. Um, I find all they do is, unless you're building like a massive site that has all the different elements, you generally reset a whole bunch of shit that you never use. And it makes it really, really hard to inspect, like you go into the browser and inspect a, a piece of code. You're just gonna end up seeing like this all the time and makes it really hard to find what it is you're looking for. You don't know which ones are relied on or not. So I generally try and avoid resets uh, and I think it works totally fine. Like unless you're on these big scale things maybe where this is enforced on you. But for websites that like most people, especially we build and we build some pretty big websites, you, we never needed it. How about you just style the things you need? Like, it's not that hard. Um, that's kind of how, well, that's one thing that we've, we do and works well. Um, but mind you, we don't, we can take a kind of a pretty opinionated stance on what browsers we support. It's like baked into our contracts that we only kind of operate with new things. Um, so things like normalize that, that work on old browsers, you know, uh, maybe you need that. But for what we do, we don't need it. Um, this one's a big one, it's pretty obvious, but you run into it still all the time. Uh, be semantic, so what that means is like call things what they do, not what they look like. So you don't do things like, which is hilarious because this is John's whole thing. <laughs> don't, don't do things like this, like large font, big text, small text. Uh, th th this, this is not the way you're supposed to do it in a semantic kind of way. And also like just call, like don't call it like, uh, yeah, blue background. Like, it, it's funny because if anyone's read the notes, that's what Tailwind CSS is all about. But this is generally how you do it if you're not using like a frame, an opinionated framework like that. So do it like this. Call it what it is, uh, not what it looks like, and just call them the right things. It's not that hard. Name things what they do. Give it a file name that matches. So th this is a view thing. So if everyone's not using view. So if, if, if your first class is called block movie review, Generally, that's how you'll, like, you'll find this two years from now, is you'll just inspect it in the browser and you'll start looking for block movie review. 
You won't necessarily have dev tools or like a client that sends you like a screenshot of a bug or something. They're not going to have you dev tools installed, so you're not going to be able to find this. So finding them off the classes or some sort of identifying thing in the markup is how you'll end up finding this. So I think a good pattern is first class is the file name. Like it should match. If it doesn't, I think you're kind of doing it wrong. Why not just commit to doing it consistently? Um, so that's it. Just be consistent. Like whatever, if you don't do what I'm saying, do something else consistently. Don't mess around with sometimes hyphens, sometimes camel case, sometimes not. Stick with what you're doing here. Um, yeah. Make it predictable is really the thing. Um, avoid the use of uh, element name selectors in CSS. So like don't style it off a h2 or a div or a ul or an li. It's almost, it's a very powerful selector. I think it's almost at the top of the ones you can use. So if you want to override that like in a breakpoint or something, you have to use that to do it again. So you'll end up, you'll see like bad code. If you're looking at bad code, you'll see a lot of like deep selectors trying to override something like what, what's done here. So don't do that. <laughs> Give it a, a title and a title and then it's way easier to override. I would say in general, you want to be as least specific as you can be with CSS. Like don't reach super down and have like, you know, div, title, h2, then style it. You can just style it straight top level with h2, or not h2, but like class. Uh, don't use IDs uh, unless you're using them for like a JavaScript selector. Like if you're not in a view world, like often that'd be like in jQuery or something. If you actually need to select this one thing in JavaScript, give it an ID. In Vue, you'd use a ref or something. But you should never style based off the IDs. Um, the only times you would even really want to put them in the code is if you actually need to like, use the, the ID selector for uh, like a hash tag link, a hash link in the URLs. That's, that's originally what they were for. Like anchor tags mean link like, to an anchor on the page somewhere, which would be this. So if you put hash, article, dash, whatever this ID is in the URL, you will jump to this article tag. That's what it's for. So don't use them for anything else, really. Um, but otherwise, they're too powerful and they're impossible to override. So that, that's how you're supposed to use those. Is there a performance difference in CSS between class and ID? I don't think it's in, in CSS. I, I don't think so. Or it, certainly, I've never run into anything like that. But in JavaScript and document query selector and stuff, there's big differences especially if you have lots of things. Like if, you have, if you've got like a whole hundreds of table cells or something and you want one specific one, then you'd want to pick it off the ID okay. because that's way faster. Um, but that comes down to the, the query selector, like this query selector, query selector by ID, class name, like you want to use the ID in that scenario. So oftentimes, yeah, like I, maybe three times, a, a month we might use an ID for something. Like, it's very, very uncommon. It's another one of those things I just look at straight away in a code and think someone did something wrong here. Um, uh, I, this is a little bit of a controversial one. I try and avoid using pseudo elements in CSS unless there's two scenarios that I like to do. But pseudo elements, if anyone doesn't know, is this like before or after? <laughs> yeah, before or after. Um, there's a bunch of other ones, first letter, last letter, stuff like that. Those ones would be good if you're like, you know, you um, type designer. What's the, the big word, the big letter at the start of a word in a paragraph, do you know? <laughs> That's a deep cut. You know, if you're like doing the fancy letter at the start of a, of a paragraph of text, maybe you'd want to use it. But generally doing something like this where you, you see this a lot weirdly in lists. Someone will try and put like a descriptor of what the list is in content or something, which really you, you're just being a little, I think you're being lazy or something because that, the right way to do that is just to put it in the markup. I, I don't know what the SEO penalty for doing this is, but I expect it's bad because I don't think Google gets this far into your code to understand that this is a word. Yeah, it, it's bad. It's bad for a lot of reasons. The only time I ever use it or I'm happy to use it is for like a decoration of something, especially like an underline in a menu. That, that's what this, what this would be doing, where you kind of just create like an empty element just so you can style it and then like have a hover state or something to make like an underline work or something. That, that would be a pain to do 
other way, like the old way would be to put like a span in every one of these that you animated or something, and then you're adding a ton of markup to do like a little thing. So, so in my mind, that it's really the, one of the only times you'd want to do that. Uh, if anyone's got other ways or other ideas, I would love to hear it. <laughs> um, again, big reason is it's also very confusing to try and track that down in an inspector, like because it doesn't really exist. The, the dev tools have gotten better at sort of highlighting those now, but it, it especially used to be really hard to find. Um, then, it occurred to me, if any, there's some young people here, they might not have ever used floats, and <laughs> that would be a blessed life. But if you've used floats or you still use floats, you don't need to and you should stop using them. Um, this is m mostly because grids and flexbox have made them like super not needed anymore, and, the, and the, they were always abused anyway. Like, they were kind of used to, to do what Flexbox does way better. Um, again, we might use these t once every six months. We, we might need to use a float for something weird. Generally, if it'd be like offsetting like a weird grid, deliberately trying to make it look weird, like, like a asymmetrical or something. But even then, you're better off using grids or flex or something. Um, the, if you are going to use floats for some reason, I'll, I'll, if you Google like, how to use floats, they'll, they'll talk about clear fixes all the time, and if anyone's used those, you don't even really need to do that either. If, you, if you're comfortable with overflow hidden, this is a neat little like, ha like workaround uh, to not need a clear fix to make that work. Like if you did this, you had a big div like this with two things floated in it, without the clear fix, the, 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 the surrounding div would actually measure height zero, because the floats don't take up height. But if you put overflow hidden on it, it would actually be the full height that you wanted it to be. So. Um, this one was a big, this, this is a big one that like will make your life way easier and is easy to do. Just centralize your main Z index settings. Do not be, so like on a website you might have like your sort of generic kind of content sort of container thing, footer header menu, whatever it might be. Put all those in one place, like I put them in like base, if it's view, like base C CSS or something. and then. You can only change them here. This makes it so easy to change if you add like some other thing that needs to go in the middle of this. You just change it one place and not have to worry about it. And then on an indiv individual like component level, you want to style, like this is just a convention that we do here, is big ones go by hundreds. And then when I'm inside a component and I need like to, to sort of move something specifically around, I'll z-index the, the base at zero and then each one of these would go up by tens if you needed them to. Um, but this z-indexing this one at zero is really important. Like any time there's a position absolute inside a component, you should be thinking, okay, I should position relative and z-index whatever the parent sort of thing in my like little scope is. Otherwise, if you don't do that, this will start styling off of like the window or something. And then at some point down the road, you'll forget all of that and you'll wonder where the hell this line is coming from or something. So this is a good habit to get into. Um, use positioning very sparingly, like especially absolute positioning. It, it, it's so abused. It's we'll we'll like ha have um, prospective hires do uh, like uh, coding tests, and we deliberately put things in here that we know the average person will like abuse. And position absolute is like one of the sh number one things that just people go turbo and put it on everything. You really don't need to do it. Um, it's it's. You should really try hard not to do it before you do it. Like, don't reach for that first. Um, I, I would say flexbox and posi static positioning is almost always better if you're trying to like, like vertically center something is a common thing that people would do, which is like this way, where you would like position it down 50, left 50, you know, and then translate it back and have it centered like that. Especially if it was like a, we, we, a common like design we would have is like an image with a piece of text in the middle of it. And this is how most people will try and do it. This will give you all kinds of headaches because you don't know how long the text is going to be. It's not going to wrap correctly now because position absolute has no height or width really to it. So this sort of thing, even though it's more code, is absolutely like a better way to do it. Like you want to sort of position it if you're going the absolute way in one direction and then just try and have it take up its own size and height and all that kind of stuff on its own. Um, yeah, so that's, this is another little common pattern that I'll talk about later. Like, I, we try and, try and group these things. I know there's some linting tools that will, like, organize these in sort of alphabetical order or whatever you want. The more of that stuff, the better, really. But I try and kind of, like, 
you know, these are all my flexbox ones, these are all my sort of positioning ones or whatever it might be. Um, Yeah. Not really. No, I, again, I'm not trying to do it the most efficient always, like in terms of lines of code. I'm trying to do it the easiest to understand and the least likely to cause us problems down the road. And because everything we do is through a CMS, we don't get to control how long text is and how, what kind of image they put in or all that kind of stuff. So you really want to build it in a flexible way, which, which which HTML and CSS originally was made to sort of do that. Like it's meant to sort of lay out and that's why elements have like their own intrinsic s sizes and heights and block and inline block and all those things is to sort of be somewhat kind of style themselves really. Um, anyway. uh, this one is my biggest pet peeve and causes me the most sort of like friction with freelancers or whoever that come in here is you do not need to just wrap like wrap things in a div or wrap things because you're trying to get some style. Like uh, a common one is this, like we have a logo file and they'll wrap it in like a div called logo and then put a link and the logo in it. Like you don't need this, this second div, it's doing nothing. Just remove it and style the thing. Um, the same goes with uh, like anytime you're trying to like do vertical text, like take a text and like, you know, have it say like, you know, something up, up the page like this. You, a lot of people put it inside two divs to rotate it because they don't understand how translates work and transforms rotates work and stuff. So just take the time to like figure out how to do it without a div. You almost always don't need some wrapping thing. Um, yeah. Uh, just a, why less markup in my opinion is like always better if you can do it. Um, uh, act, this is just how we like to organize our components. So. Um, You'll see a lot of people sort of just do it as they do it. Like, all right, on m mobile, this, uh, if we use, um, if people aren't familiar with SCSS, this is like an SCSS media query variable. variable. Um, they'll just sort of like do it as they need it or as they go. Uh, we like to organize them sort of like, here's my base level component. Here's different states that I might have, if it's open or closed or active or, hov you know, or whatever. Then the hover one. And we, this is a cool little, um, trick we use, if you actually looked at what this media query was, it's uh, the word hover, colon, hover. <laughs> media query, hover, hover. And what that does is says, does, my device, does the device looking at this support hover states? Because a lot of the time we'll run into mobile having like the hover state turned on and doing nothing, you know, or doing something weird, like if you clicked on it. So this says only, this is really sort of good for that. Then we do our breakpoints at the end. Um, so like it's less than tablet or whatever. You make those all up, whatever you need. But so that's kind of the like pattern that we I try and stick to with comments of each one, nice little white spacing. I think it, it makes it the easiest to sort of understand what's going on. Um, in view with components now, I think you, you, you if you're doing, I don't know, 100 lines of a breakpoint, you probably need to think it through again, or the different components. Like, just if you looked at all the components we build, rarely do they have like lots of breakpoints. Well, I'll get into that in a bit. Um, with uh, SCSS, avoid going more than two levels deep. This is actual real code from a freelancer that did some sh some shitty work for us. Um, <laughs> to, uh, this is a me one time. yeah. Sorry, Kobe. No. Um, and Funkhouse team, don't laugh because there's your code is in this too somewhere in other slides. Um, th th this is a mess. Um, you do not need to go like deep on selectors like this. And if you're going more than two, start asking yourself. But certainly at three, like you're doing something wrong. Um, that's a good way to spot a red flag. So it's an importance of like the hackiest, worst thing you can do. Um, so don't do that. Uh, but another one here, here that's worth mentioning is like, uh, I have some better full codes of this, but like this thing is inside meta and you're calling it meta name, just call it name. Like you don't need to namespace all this stuff, especially in SCSS. This is clearly from a guy who's new to SCSS and is just like kind of not familiar with like how it's namespacing everything pretty much or like indenting stuff. Um, so this is like a way better way to do the same thing. It's not nearly as deep. 
which means it's not hard to override in a breakpoint. Like if you wanted to override this slide image in a breakpoint, or even worse, this one, you would have to like swipe up, swipe aside, slide zero, but you'd have to do all of these again. Or you would have to put some really powerful selector at the top, like an element name or an ID, which are things we shouldn't do. So this, keep it as, again, as least specific, so as shallow as it can be, is always better. Uh, you never need to use background images. Again, surprising how many people still do this. It's horribly, it's horrible for responsive. You're going to force the browser to download whatever you tell it in the URL. There's no, at the moment, there's not really good support for like back, what would be a source set for background images. And if you're not familiar with source set, it, it looks like this. And what that is, is your browser creates like a big JSON blob of like all the different image sizes you want. Now, if you're building like a manual site, that's a pain, but if it's coming out of a CMS, like everything we do, these get generated automatically and it's easy. But these are really important and I encourage you to look them up. Uh, and so what it does is the browser will only download the, the right size image for how whatever size the thing is that you're asking it for. Um, so it's very efficient. Um, and, and if you did it this way, you, you, that just doesn't work. Also, uh, Google apparently is okay at catching this stuff, but uh, in my experience, it's not. It will not really be aware of this image. And then if it is, you don't get things like alt tags. You don't get things like um, the ARIA labels or any of the accessibility stuff if you do it this way. Um, so this way is way better. It's an image. Use an image. So those are created with derivatives, like different choices, derivative sizes? Or? Um, it's an array of all the sizes. So you have the source set is like all the file names and linking to a size like sort of attribute. And then this is just like a kind of an, a big array of sizes. It's worth looking up. It's definitely confusing. Like this is one of those things where the people that I think made this spec probably weren't actual web developers that had to use this shit. <laughs> um, but we just solved it like solved it once in a CMS and never thought about it again. <laughs> um, but the concept of source set is you basically you basically save uh, on your back end like let's say small, medium, and large images. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Um, and then this is how you would, like, when you're doing this, what you're trying to do generally is get, like, background size cover. So, like, cover the whole thing edge to edge or, like, full bleed. So, that's what this object fit property does. And it's, it's a little bit confusing where you, you pretty much have to kind of, like, stretch the image. You sort of say, how big, I, I like to think of it as, like, in terms of a stage. How big is the stage, which is this 0, 0, 100%, that's basically saying 100%. And then object fit says what to do with the image inside the stage. And so it, it, you have cover, contain, there's, a, there's sort of a bunch of other ones, um, but cover and contain are the main ones that we pretty much use all the time. And then you can do object position if you want to like skew it left or right, or up and down or whatever. And that all respects like cover. It, we, basically the same as background position and background size, those, those ones. Um, it's really good. There, there is some... Like that way, this way has some fallbacks too, especially if you want to know the size of this image after the fact. Like a common thing that we need to do is like we'll have a, an image that's like contained, which would be like fitted inside this square, but not, not, not crop it in any way. We need to know what size that is so that we can animate like a video to that size. And you, the JavaScript, if you tried to measure this image, it will just measure its full, full size. So there's some... Um, really handy JavaScript libraries called uh, Intrinsic Ratio that will like do this sort of calculations for you um, in intrinsic scale, I think they're called. And your exact object um, position, that you don't need to do that percentage and stuff, does that play into the, the focal point stuff that we do as well? Yeah, we use this to, to um, what we call focal pointing, like someone's face in the image you want in the center. So we'll like figure out where that is, and you can use percentages to position this, like 30% to the left, 20% down, or whatever. Um, so that's how we do the fo focal point thing. And then you can put arrays in, not not real arrays, but like multiple images, and you can do all kinds of different weird stuff with them too. It's worth looking into. Can you mess up the aspect ratio doing that? Um, some of the settings you can, if you wanted to. There's like stretch and stuff. Yeah, yeah. So you got to be careful. Um, depending on what, what this is going to be, yes, yeah, yeah. That, yeah. Is it better to just force it on one dimension 
in the other dimension that it matches so that the aspect ratio will not be impacted. Well, cover won't stretch it. There's a different, so this won't mess up with the aspect ratio. But you say hard time percent, but you do it at 100% and then you say cover the whole space. Yeah, so it will, it will like, it, it, it'll, it, it'll sort of crop into it or like move it. So like, let's say by default, it was like a, we put a big panoramic image on this screen. So like part of the image will be over here and not, and be sort of like cropped. And you position this like left or right, it will like move this in all the way to the point that it can before it will not be covered anymore. So it's very smart. It works really well. We've never had an aspect ratio problem with this. O only with um, stretch or ones where you deliberately don't care about it being skewed. So you have to watch out for portrait versus landscape. So yeah. Square images. Yeah. Especially like we, we, so everything we do is 16 by 9 ratio because it's movie, it's like movie screen stuff, all our clients, Hollywood stuff. So on a screen, like a desktop, desktop screen, it's this kind of ratio, it looks great. But then this same image goes onto a phone and it, it's now like this middle of the dude's face. So that problem is a thing. But it's CSS, it's easy to override. You'll just do it a breakpoint and, and you'll change this to be contain or something. So um, again, it's the way to do it. Um, this one is this like old, I, I wonder how many people are familiar with the idea of this, but this is like an old thing that came out of like the original sort of way you used HTML, which was like blog emails or something like version one HTML. Margin, collapsible margins are so important to not fight against this. So okay, just explain it. You've got two block level elements next to each other. They both get margin 100 between them. And this one has, the bottom one has a top margin of 50. So you would think, okay, so between the two of these, they're gonna get 150 between the two of them. But that is absolutely not what will happen with the collapsible margins. The biggest one of the two that are touching will become the number. So it will be 100 between these, not 150, because the margins collapse, and that's what collapsible margins do. That's how this works just by default. Um, that's also why you shouldn't, if, unless you did deliberately intend to do this, use padding for top and bottom. If it's something that is in, in a flow, like, um, like a blog post or a news article, for us, we call them like video case studies where it might be like a video player at the top, some text, you know, a thumbnail or like a, a gallery of images, a quote, you know, it's like some big thing explaining like this amazing movie we made. If you try and start putting mar paddings top and bottom, then you start messing with margins and all kinds of stuff, it's a problem. So a good rule of thumb, and this will save you so much trouble if you ever had to build a long, long page like that, is margins top and bottom, paddings left and right. That's really the only thing you should do. Like paddings top and bottom, you almost never need to do it. Unless it's like a footer and you deliberately want padding and it's not, you're not caring about like some collapsible margin coming up against it. Um, it's a hard thing to explain, but if you start building something like this, just, you'll, you'll trust me. <laughs> and margins are not box model or elements. No, no, that, that's padding, yeah. Some news thing. Yeah, yeah. The, the, that one, I, I should try and get a better example, but it would require like a, more than a screen room they have. But I'd be happy to share uh, some more stuff on this if anyone wants after. Um, this is a view, Nuxt view thing. Um, with router links, I've found you can really make your life difficult if you start doing stuff like this, where you, you're just sort of pushing onto the end of the URL. Um, I think you, as a rule, it's certainly easier to just to, shoot, to say to yourself, every link starts at the root of my domain, so it starts with a slash, and then I just build my URL every time. Um, otherwise, what happens is you'll get an email from a client saying, I ended up at you know, some URL combination that you have no idea how they got to that, <laughs> and it's going to be very hard to figure that out after the fact. If you know, well, that's not true, not possible because all of my URLs start with the route, then you know, okay, at some point I've just pushed the wrong URL there. Not, they clicked on some weird combination to end up somewhere where I never thought they'd be able to get to. Um, so it's much more of a predictable design pattern to kind of stick to this. It's easier with CMSs because you, you're never really building these necessarily. Um, 
uh, and you can also, just a little sort of hint, this, this again is like old school stuff that I don't know how many times, you know, like a modern developer wouldn't have to deal with this stuff, but you can do some cool things with these router links where you do the dot dot slash or dot dot slash dot dot slash and it will go back up the URL, like two chunks and stuff like that. It's really good for like back buttons or like a close out of this thing I'm looking at button. Um, that's, that's one I've had to teach every new hire pretty much. Uh, this is how you do forms in Vue. <laughs> this is how everyone does it the first time and then I yell at them and then they do it this way. <laughs> this is the way you do it. You want to have a form with a submit and a prevent on it and then a button that does nothing <laughs> but it submits the form and then you capture the, the form getting submitted. You don't want to have two submits because this People will do this, and then I'll, then it will be like, well, I'm on the iPhone. I click the done button, nothing happens, you know. Or like, I'm, yeah. What if I got to click enter in a text area, and my form submits, and then they start building all these conditionals to only submit when everything, you know. No, this is how you do it. This is another. There's another point that I'm going to come to later, which is like, don't fight the browser. It's like the worst thing you can do is try and like, do something that the browser's built another way for you to do it. Just do it the way the browser wants you to do it, which is a form. <laughs> like, don't put in a div, you know, all this kind of stuff. Like, give it a form, give it labels. Um, this is a good little common error that everyone does is where they won't use a label or they'll put label just around the word email and not around the whole thing. The advantage of doing this is like, one, it's better for like tabbing, for accessibility, tabbing through everything. Two, if you click on the word email, this will become active. So this, there's a bunch of like browser functionality built into a label wrapping and input that is just free stuff. You should do it. Um, Sanu, we discovered like a really weird iPhone bug with the done button, right? What, no, what was that though? Was that the done button when you're filling out an input and you click the done button in, on the iPhone? Do you remember what that was? Was this the ICM one? Yeah. Yeah. The, 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 the way the iPhone keyboard and the word done or submit that comes up on that little iPhone keyboard. Yeah, like there was no enter button. I yeah. This was a while ago. Yeah, anyway, there's some weird stuff with those kinds of things. It's just things to think about like, all right, there's different ways you can interact with forms and they're a nightmare. Um, this is a personal opinion of mine. Um, this is some funk outs code that someone here wrote and still believes in. Um, <laughs> um, just multiple if statements like this and multiple returns. This is just a personal, fully a personal opinion of mine. I prefer to have one return in a function, um, something I'm sh we should all debate. Uh, and I prefer switch statements for long like conditionals. I try and only do an if, if it's one thing. And I'll show you an example of that later, like if or else, and that's it. If it becomes multiples like this, I think a switch statement was always better and easy to read, way easy to understand. Um, I like to do this kind of pattern rather than the, def the, the if you've never used a switch before, there's another case that's just called default, which could override this. Um, but because you need to declare the, the variable to like set it in each one anyway, I, you don't need the default. So you just set the default and then override it. This was actually like a little pattern that I was taught from a, um, a Netflix en engineer once, and I always respected it for it, was set your default and then override it and most of the time, that you'll only need to do that and then an if. You won't even need an else. Um, providing that the thing you're setting doesn't require like a resource that takes expensive to get, like a, a request to the server or something. Then you wouldn't want to do this because do it every time. But if it's just a, a sort of static setting like that, that's the way I like to do it. Yeah, yeah, cases are way more efficient at scale, like switch statements, but we never do anything at that scale. But if you were like hundreds of them, it's way better. Sometimes people, what they miss is the break statement. Yeah, yes. Well, that's a good point. That you don't need these break statements, which are, uh, can be confusing to debug if you're not paying attention, but can also be super powerful because you can stack these cases. So you could say, like if, if I didn't have this, I could go, mobile and tablet would be both this. So they, they sort of stack down, which is really handy. If you've got like a whole bunch of things that should do one thing, it's good. Oh, so if you don't break out, then it would just start. It would just go, if you had no breaks, it would end up, the well, the last one would be the one, yeah. Yeah, the whole thing. 
Yeah, yeah this is. Logic. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yes. It's 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 a matter of opinion. This is easy to read, but um, okay. This is a something that we have battled with. Oh, man, the amount of support time and QA and everything wasted on fucking 100 VH is insane. I don't know if anyone is familiar with this, but to recap, uh, 100 VH is a view height unit. So think of it as 100. One VH is one unit, one percent of the view height of the browser window. So on desktop, it makes sense. It's from the bottom of the browser to right below the address bar, pretty much. That's but one. that's a hundred. Oh, okay. Yeah, hundred VH. On mobile, Apple, in all of their wisdom, said hundred VH is from the bottom of the address bar to the bottom of the screen, assuming that it's in a small mode. Right? So you know how like when you scroll down on a phone, the, like, you are, the address bar will get a little bit skinnier and the bottom bar will disappear altogether. So it, it doesn't look right. Like if you, most, if you just had like one thing on a desktop, it would be this at 100 VH. And then on mobile, it would, be like, it would actually be this. <laughs> Until, you scroll. Until you scroll. And then this won't actually change. It'll just stay this. But the, the Chrome goes away and it now actually looks like 100 VH. So if you were doing like scroll down indicators, design the Yeah. It's going to be down here. <laughs> Yep, it's a nightmare. So there's, there's a whole... Now, so what some, some, someone started this Medium post kind of trying to go down this rabbit hole when it first became a thing. And Apple said, this is expected behavior and they're not going to fix it. So that's what the world we got stuck with. And then Chrome did it differently for a while and then said, because Apple sucks, we'll deliberately suck. And so now this is the way it's going to be. So... We try to come up with all these different ways of doing it. Now, if you measure the window in JavaScript, you'll get the right number every time. It, you'll get what you expect, even on a phone and even on desktop. You'll get this number. So we, for a while there, we were trying to sort of build like a view directive that was v, v full height that would like do this. And there's a whole bunch of different solutions. This is one that we came up with and I think is the best, which is we set a um, CSS var uh, like this to begin. At just the regular one, and then we override it when uh, on, a, on what we think is a mobile. Now, you could do this using some browser feature detect or something like that, which would be another great way to do it. Uh, this is just a quick little way I wanted to show you, like just look at the window width. Now, if you're going to do any kind of window width monitoring, which is like definitely not the first thing you should try and do because it's very inefficient, you want to throttle that stuff, and that's low dash throttle. We'll get into low dash in a second. Low dash throttle will do this only 330 times a second. Yeah, yeah, 30 times a second. Well, anyway, throttle it. It won't run it like all the time. <laughs> uh, well, you could do the user agent thing too. Yeah, yeah, you could do that too. I think this is a little bit more reliable because the user agents change and stuff, and they're not always the same. Um, but the real thing would be to do like some feature detection, like the hover thing would be a good idea, actually. Like, the, do, do you have a hover state and then assume that it's mobile maybe, but then like, like surface tablets? Anyway, we went with width. Um, and then we, 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 you can use JavaScript to set the CSS files, which is what's happening here. So over uh, 1024 width, we just use the regular CSS 100 VH, it's great. And then when, once we go below that, we start doing some window height detection and set it to the right thing. So this works really, really well. It's very efficient. If you um, put a little uh, trans, um, transition on whatever this thing is, transition of the height, it'll like, you can animate it a little bit not, and it doesn't even look, you don't even really notice it. Anyway, I recommend this. Well, that'll, that's still below 1024. Okay. And, and even iPads and stuff actually measure out at 1024. Yeah, right. yeah. Um, so here's just a couple of little quick, quick hits at the end here. Um, for class names of like different states, I like to do is state, like so whatever the state, is active, is open, is closed, whatever, or has, what? Is mobile. Yeah, is mobile is another one we use all the time. Has a feature, like has an image, has a... Uh, or whatever, whatever. <laughs> um, or not, you know, like this would be not case study, not blog article or something like that if you need those. Try and put the is, has, not at the start of it. Is active, is open, has video, whatever. Um, common, common 
element names that we use, uh, this is not like advice, just we like have blocks that'll so be like news block, image block, word block or whatever they might be and we have grids, blocks sit inside grids. So we have this grid with this block generally. So it'd be like video, video block inside a video grid. But we would name them like grid dash video, block dash video, so you sort of know they all match. Um, panels, so we use like menu panel or like overlay panel or newsletter panel, like something we use. Um, menu all the time obviously. Um, Overlay meta is something that we use a lot. So like we'll have a video with some text below it, like credits or something. We'll call it like meta that'll have the title and who directed it. That's the one we use and title, title, section. So we use section all the time. That generally sits with a HTML5 section element. And then inside, like if we've got like work, news, you know, it'll be like section title would be the word work. That's how we differentiate between like section title and regular title. Section normally is like something I think of as like the whole page you're looking at and a block is like a little, th little thing in it. Yeah. Um, this one, use Lodash. You're definitely not getting points for doing some weird shit with map or filter. Like, and people will come in and be like, I know JavaScript and they'll go crazy with some filter or map thing or whatever. That's cool if you know JavaScript, but if like uh, some people that have come to work here, like, that's not their strongest suit. This shit is so confusing if there's like Lodash remove or whatever, you know. So Lodash, you should totally use. If you don't use it, it's, I think it's really good. In, um, in uh, view, you can import just the thing you need. So it's very efficient. You don't have to bring in all of Lodash. You can just bring in this one little function. It's really handy. Um, oh, I'm going the wrong way. Uh, don't fight the browser. Something the design's always trying to get us to do. Uh, fuck with the scroll position. Um, it's generally easier to try and work with the scroll bar than fight against it, like turn it off and tap into the mouse wheel or the, the um, you know, trackpad or whatever and try and figure out where scroll would normally be. That's always going to lead down a road of nightmares um, and really hard on cross browsers and they all handle it differently. Just just work with the scroll bar. Same with events and like history. Anything that's built into the browser, generally use that unless there is a real strong need to not do that or you're trying to like build some tech showcase piece to get a job at Google that you deliberately want to do it some other way. But generally stay within the browser. Um, use white spacing in your templates and group similar things like I showed some examples before. Don't just like mash everything close to each other and expect someone to be able to read it. I'm going to show an example. Oh, wait, I have a good, this is a good one. Um, I wonder if this, I can just open this real quick. Nope. Anyway, I'll, I'll show it to you in a minute. Um, order your CSS in the same way your markup is in. So if you've got the menu at the top, put your CSS with menu at the top <laughs> and then go from there. Don't, don't do it the way, it, like, if your markup has a button here, but you've actually like position fixed it down here, put it in the top anyway, because most of the time you want to be able to look at the code and see how it all lines up. You won't be looking at the actual rendered website. So line it up more on where it occurs in the code. Um, don't use font icon, like icon fonts. So like font awesome and all those kinds of ones. Um, they, yeah, it's, I hate it. I hate it. Um, it's got all kinds of separation concerns issues for me and stuff. Uh, fonts are fonts and they're supposed to be like words. Use SVG for those sorts of things. Um, they're way better. That comes with a whole bunch of styling stuff that's way easier to do. Um, I think the icon fonts thing is like kind of good for like a bootstrappy. I'm just trying to do this as quick as I can but people don't learn the next thing, which is the right way, which I think is, that's what uh, SVGs are for. Um, these are just like concepts that I think everyone could just do a little better at doing, which is really think hard about what can be a component and makes a site really hard if you don't componentize everything. I mean, it's an obvious one because we're all here for view and we all love components, but still it's a common thing. Like I get components and then they have files that are super long, like no, components. Know what comp components you have in your shared library. Um, something that everyone will do, like they'll start a new job and then I'll just like, oh, I built this slideshow. And it's like, 
We already have 10 slideshows we've built. <laughs> so a good thing to do is to learn which ones you have if you're in a team, what everyone has. Um, and then it's on guys like me to make sure it's easy for everyone to find that stuff, which I've been bad at. <laughs> um, don't do things rough with the expectation of coming back to it. Do it right the first time and think it through. Like so many times someone will just like hammer through this thing. Oh, I, I'm just going to get it working and then work backwards to make it better. That's not the point. That is not the whole idea of like iteration. That's misunderstanding the concept of that. What you're supposed to do is think of, I've got to get to here. What's a natural step to get from there to there to there to there to there? Not like build this shit and then try and polish it all the way back. It's build little chunks better and better and better as you need it. Like that's the way to do it. Um, common one to that is like in, I did a talk recently about SEO head tags and like it's way easier to do them each page you build if you're building a page at a time than it is to sort of like, I'll oh, get to the end and then go back and do all my SEO stuff. That, that's, you're going you're gonna, to you're gonna leave holes if you do that. Um, this one's a big one just if you're trying to sort of level up in terms of your ability to kind of like be self-learning is learn how to spot your own red, red flags. The common ones are how long, like especially in the view world, how long is your file? Like you really don't need big files in view. Like it's, it's an easy one. It's not even, you don't even need to be a good programmer to know that. Just how long is this file? Oh, it's really long. Well, you can probably componentize it a lot more. You can probably streamline something. So start with that. Is your CSS super deep nested like I showed before? Reduce that. You'll probably have to change some, file, some class names in your markup. That's the point. <laughs> You're better at it. If you're watching a lot of things, like in view, if you've got a lot of watches, ask yourself, do you really need that? Can you watch it in one place and commit it to the store and then it all becomes reactive from there? If you're like watching window width in 10 different files, move it into your like layout and watch it in one place and then go off the store there. Generally, like most components need to watch two things, three things at most. If you're watching like four, five, 10 things, you probably doing it wrong unless you've got some weird use case for it. Um, if you've got lots of specific breakpoints, like I, I've been debugging a, an old site where it's like, we had ones for like this wide, this wide, short, a little bit shorter, like it becomes like a nightmare. And really you can, um, if you start thinking in like, everything gets a max width kind of, like anytime you use width 100%, think, oh, well should that have a max width? If you start doing that, you, you'll, you'll get better at breakpoints. Um, and then committing to the store a lot. That's generally a, a case of like either you're building something really complicated and you need to do this or you've not done it right. Because um, you don't really need to use the store that much, like a, a little bit, um, depending, on, depending on your backend setup. Some, some sites will like every page will grab something in the store and commit it. But I'm talking about like things opening and closing and stuff like that. You can do that generally like locally in a component using the data. Like just is this component open or closed? Doesn't need to, the store doesn't need to know that like this one little menu opened or closed. Um, unless you care about persistent states and stuff like that. But it's a common thing I see. Um, and then this is just some good browser habits. Organize your windows on your computer screen into panels. So like a good one is like, this will be my code editor. This will be the browser I'm looking at, you know, and I might have like my, my dev tools down the bottom like this, um, or I might have my console and my dev tools, you know, and then full code or something like that. Don't rely with, I'm just going to go with the 50 tabs open and I'm going to have, you know, seven different windows all laid on top of each other and none of them are sized optimally in my screen. The only people who do that are shitty developers. Good ones are really organized with their screen. Um, use Prettier along, well, I prefer Prettier, but there's different ones of this, but if you don't know this, look it up. It's like auto code formatting kind of on save. It's a great little saying. It's like everyone hates people formatting their code except yours. <laughs> so you definitely want to use Prettier. I think it's really good. Um, and then any, we, this, this is if you want to look at the code that we do. We have some linting tools that are built in on save and stuff like that. Um, the more of those, like, kind of the better, really, as long as um, you're doing it consistently in, in your team. Like, generally, if you start work at a team, they'll have, or if not, you should propose to them that we all get on the same sort of, like, linting standards. Uh, it helps. Then you never have to worry about indenting or, like, two-space, four-space, all that kind of stuff. What's that, uh, That's our little um, 
that's our like Nuxt framework that we've built to integrate with WordPress really, really good. Um, and that's just, we keep that, we're updating that every day with like features as we get them. Um, so there's, it's a good place to look at like um, how we do things if you want. It's open source, you can look at it. The other one I found out the other day that's all open source is the Nuxt.org website. So if you want to see how Nuxt and those guys want you to build a website, you should look at the Nuxt.org code base. It's really good. There's some stuff in there that's like not released yet that you could just go and grab. Um, the, the, if anyone's using Nuxt, a feature that's coming down the road in Nuxt is auto-generating of static site websites. Like you don't have to pass in all the routes, which is big because like if you're working with a CMS, you have to generate these giant blobs of all the URLs of the website which if it's a CMS can be thousands of thousands of pages and pass it off to Nuxt so it can generate them all. But Nuxt has built a crawler to crawl, or like it's like an indexer that will index your site on build and then know the routes all ahead of time. It like looks through the code for Nuxt links. And that is in the Nuxt.org website. You can just go get that module right now and start using it, which, which we're about to do. Um, yeah, and uh, that's it, so thanks. Yeah. Um, do you have any advice if um, you want, kind of want to do a total refactor of our uh, CSS, pretty much to rip it all out? Yeah. Start from scratch. Okay. Because it's just gotten so. Yeah. Uh, in, in, in it's a view website or? No, it's uh, Rails, but. Um, but is it organized around components like a view thing or is it just one big giant S CSS file? Success files, yeah. Man, that's gonna be, that's just a tough, that's a tough one. There's this thing in CSS that it, everyone, that's why Tailwind and these kinds of things that John's gonna talk about interesting is like, CSS over time is this thing that no one wants to delete. It's all, it becomes like this additive programming language that just everyone just adds to it and over time, so you do need to refactor it all. I think, did John, he's went to the bathroom, but he gave a great talk on like refactoring an existing Rails website into Vue, one component at a time. Because Vue, you can just, this one little part of a website can be Vue and the rest of it can be Rails. That is, if, you can, if you've got the political juice to make that happen, that's more the direction I would go in. Slowly, slowly integrate. Slowly integrate Vue and then make each little bit a component. Not that kind of thing. Yeah, okay. It's not even like that. Yeah, okay. So, I, I would, man, I don't even know how I would do that. Like refactoring entire websites, just CSS. Dump it all out. Just, and you say it's spread across multiple files. Yeah. Yeah. You definitely start by thinking about, okay, each one of these can be a component. And then yeah. can you, I mean, one way to make that easier, I guess, and less conflicting is to think of it like scoped styles in, if you can get away with that. We don't actually use scope styles. We sort of more enforce that with like our class naming, sort of namespacing. So that kind of scoped, but the parent can style down a few times. Like we'll do that for things like a grid where if there's like two blocks, we want them to be like left aligned. And if there's three, it would be like centered aligned or, or the opposite maybe. Three would be like, so we'll like have the parent be like, oh, if you only have two of these things, text align left or something like that. You can't do that with the scoped attribute. But if you, if you don't need that level of thing, then thinking of it like components would probably be the only way to do it. And you could just look at it and be like, okay, you could just start again almost. Like leave the, yeah, or leave the current, leave the current site as it is and then just start writing like all the CSS for each one. And you might, uh, if you have like good dev access to it, you could, um, one, one thing that we did in the past was like, if you were like a certain type of user and you were looking at the site, you could append like a class to the body so that you could look at it and style it all inside of this one class called like, you know, version two yeah. <laughs> and then style everything. And then once it's looking good, you can just yeah. delete version two and now everyone gets it, you know, might be a good way to do it. Yeah, don't do that. <laughs> Yeah, there's a good there's a good build tool that does that. Uh, does anyone know what it's called? Purge. Purge CSS. 
if you've got the, if, depending on your build process. Yeah. What was the name? Purge, CSS. Yeah. 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 Don't do that. <laughs> yeah. I noticed that yeah, your target thing structure just you know yeah, using class instead of like page two. Yeah. We so we looked at or we looked at no so we yeah yeah we we looked at. BEM, we never, Tailwind, I don't think it was a thing when, well, at least I wasn't aware of it when we decided on that a year or so ago. But um, we, I looked at those things, but the kind of websites, so BEM is really, if anyone doesn't know what that does, it's like, it's kind of enforces like a BEM, B, B for Bravo, E for Echo, M for Mary. Where is it being used in the context? It's a CSS like framework, and it's trying to enforce like, a style that like 10 people in a team could all use this one style. And you'll, you'd recognize it because there's a lot of like hyphens in the names. It'll be like menu hyphen, 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 hyphen something, you know? Um, so you, if you look at a site, you'll, you'll be like, this is Ben. Um, and the point of that is like, we've got 10 different buttons. So we'll have a top level sort of button component, uh, module, I guess. I don't know what, I think it's module. A, button module, and then we'll have like variations of that button, like one will be blue, one will be red. So then you get like a dash dash red. And so you sort of, sort of has a hierarchy to it. So that, that's very successful. I think Tailwind is probably, personally makes a little more sense than that now, but Tailwind's like a new thing. But we didn't go with it with them specifically because we don't build websites that are like super variant based like that. It's really just like, we might have two buttons, you know? So like we end up with all this BEM stuff to do two things, you know? So we could just have dot button, dot, you know, long button. <laughs> yeah, so that's us, yeah. So scope, the scope styles, like it makes a lot of sense if you're, if you're like what joy mode, like you guys where you're, you're one have this giant team and you, you need to be, um, very sort of isolated, like you want to be able to change this thing and not know I'm breaking something else. And I, and I was very excited about it, but then we tried and we used them a bunch and then we found that like it became impossible to those weird edge cases where you actually want to override something, like a parent to override something. Like the, a common one for us will be, because we do a lot of like grids of, here's all the commercials someone's made. And so it'll be like 50 blocks in a grid. But if there's only like, one block in a grid, you sort of want that to behave differently, or maybe you want the last block to be extra wide. And so you end up doing all these, like trying to pass in all these props to be like, I'm actually this wide, you know, or something to get past the scope thing. And what we found it was easier was just to be like, okay, as a team, we're going with this concept of it's isolating this component, don't fuck with it too much, but you can overwrite, the parent can push a style down if it needs to by just dot, you know, dot work grid, dot work block, you know. So that, that's kind of why we did it. It gives, it gives a little more flexibility on the edge case. Do you use CSS grid? We, yeah, we do, we do. It's, um, it's, it's uh, confusing to like new people. Um, let me, I want to. Uh, no, we never use bootstrap. That, that, if you're gonna go that ro road, I think tail, what John's gonna do is, is better. Um, Tailwind is better than Bootstrap in those ones. Th those ones you end up fighting against the framework like more than you do write actual code. Um, can I edit this? Yeah. Um, uh, I, I collected a bunch of um, links, this is the best practice one, of useful things. If you're gonna use grid, oh, oh sorry. Um, uh, I'm gonna actually stop this and cast the whole thing. Yeah, if you, if you use that thing, it's great. Oh, yeah. these, these are some useful little tools. If you're gonna use grid, this is a great little thing to figure it, just to learn it. Like you can change all these things and do different kind of stuff and it will give you the code for it and tell you what it all does. So that, that one's really good. Um, 
there's this demystifying nth child is a really good one, and I love this flexi one. Um, this one's really good to figure out like what you're actually doing with nth child, especially as you get more complicated with it. Um, you can do all kinds of weird, weird ones with it. Um, it's pretty handy. Uh, this one is fantastic for understanding what Flexbox does. Um, so you can do all kinds of stuff with it. Um, yeah, it's, it's really good. Um, I, I recommend it. And then, you, yeah, you can put this here and it'll show you like what you actually need. And this is like all of the legacy stuff. That one's really good. Um, do, you, do, you, do you ever take all that legacy stuff? No. Well, because our build tool does that stuff automatically. Uh, but if you don't have that, then that's great. Um, and then, well, I had this last one. Um, this had like a, this was the white space code I was trying to find before. Um, so this is just like a, a component I grabbed from my code and you might get a good, some of these are like components you won't get, like responsive image and stuff. But this is the idea of just kind of like how we try and do things, you know, has border in view effects. Um, oh, I zoom in, yeah. So, I mean, you sort of lose the white spacing when I zoom in like this, but you get it. Um, try and put a little space between components. Um, try and sort of group everything. And then when you get down into, we try and set defaults on all our props. Um, when you get down into the CSS, I like to try and group them. Like, here's my positioning stuff. Here's my Flexbox stuff. Um, don't go too, too deep with it. Um, put a little break between, uh, one line between, like, a uh, top level style and it's like child. You can see it, it all goes here. Hover state goes next, inside a hover hover. Um, break points at the bottom. Yeah. In, a, um, curiosity, do you, in your CSS, I mean in your um, like HTML, like, yep. do you, uh, stay with double quotes or singles? Uh, we go with double because it's prettier, prettier standard. Prettier just sort of dictates that stuff. We don't really decide. So Prettier's whole thing is like they've kind of, they've decided best practices and just enforce it. You have like minimal input on it. You get to basically decide like indenting. <laughs> Um, so that's, that's what Pretty does. Uh, yeah. Anything else? Or that's it. Thanks, guys. Let's let, let's let John take it away.